Amen. Amen. You know, I do. I thank you for that prayer, Michelle. And I, I do pray that God gives you uh, eyes to see and ears to hear today. Because it's so important, friends, you know, because we, uh, the world is more than what we see with our natural eyes, more than what we hear. And so we need to have our spiritual ears and eyes open, right? I, I wasn't joking before about God can tell me and I just, I'm not paying attention. I, I really believe that. I believe, I believe that we serve a God who uh, wants to be part of our life. Not to, not to dictate all of our actions and tell us what to do, right? Because he gave us a life for us to live. But he wants to be part of that. And he wants to help us and lead us. And so uh, I, I think that we need to uh, be mindful of that uh, more often than we are, let's put it that way, uh, and be open. Um, so we're um, doing a series now on 1 Corinthians 13. So yesterday during the, during the wedding, of course, uh, that was read. Uh, that whole passage of scripture was read. It's called the love chapter. Have you ever heard that read at a wedding? Sure, I think we all have. Uh, and it's beautiful for a wedding. But the uh, original intent uh, of that passage was not for a wedding. It was for a dysfunctional church, right? Like they were getting things wrong. One of the things that, as you notice here, we're going to have communion today, and I've asked my, my uh, good friend Steve, he's going to come and lead us in communion, and I'm doing that because uh, I've led communion, and, and Carl's led communion, and we all have different backgrounds and different places we come from, and if you've traveled at all, I may have been to different countries and uh, took communion. Anybody? There's all different ways, isn't there? It's all different ways to do communion. And in Africa, they, they pass around a, a goblet and it has wine in it. I always look forward to communion Sunday in France. It was a great day. Yeah. I'd pass the, a cup of wine to the next person. They'd go, oh, it's empty. I go, wow. I thought that was for me. I didn't know. And there are some traditions that, that dunk it, dunk the bread in it. Right. You, we, we all know that. So, so Steve's going to come today and he's going to. Uh, he's going to share, and he's, I think, uh, I remember I told him the first time I did communion, I was like 26 or something like that in church, and man, I was so nervous. I didn't want to get it wrong, and all this stuff, you know, and I think Steve was maybe, not nervous, just feeling a little pressure or whatever. I said, Steve, you, you, you can't get it wrong, right? You can't get it wrong. We're doing this to remember Jesus. Isn't that right? And so uh, he's going to come and lead us. I'm looking forward to that. Um, and so the, the, the passages we're looking at today are all these, don't be like this, don't, you know, don't be like this, don't be like this. And I entitled it, Love is Not a Jerk. How many of you are honest enough to say you've been a jerk to somebody before? Anybody? Al. Al. All right. Al's sitting there with his hand. He's sitting on his hands like this. Yeah. Because the truth is we all have, right? Linda, you should have grabbed his hand and lifted it up. Exactly. I know I've been. You know, I've probably been a jerk in the last couple of days. You know, I mean, that's just, but, but, but that's not love. Right? That's not love. And so last week, we, we kind of, uh, you know, talked about that. Now, so I'm not going to get into it, but, but my, my point was this. My point was, is that love directs our actions. Isn't that true? Love will direct your actions. What you love, you will gravitate towards. You will participate in. And I talked about, uh, I talked about sports, but let's say it's music, right? You, you love music. You're going you're gonna to gravitate to that, aren't you? You're going you're gonna to listen to music often. If you're, if you're uh, so gifted, you're going to play music, right? You're going to... Uh, I think of Brock and Luke and Eric, you know, they love it so much. They said, why don't we form a band? You follow me. So, so love, what you love will eventually direct your actions. You will move towards that. And so uh, my question for my own self, my own life is, uh, how is my love, for, uh, my love for Jesus shown in my actions? And so one of the things I talked about is, if, if, if I couldn't tell somebody, when I was in the hospital uh, for my surgery and everything afterwards, people would talk to me or whatever, what do you do? And I said, well, I pastor a church, right? 
Uh, so obviously they you know, well, you're a Christian or whatever, right? But if I couldn't tell people, if you couldn't tell people uh, that you were a Christian, that you loved it, or whatever, whatever way to, to, to let somebody know that, could they tell? And, and maybe they wouldn't necessarily know right off that you're a Christian, but they, they would know there's something different about you. Could they know? Would they know? You know, and, and if I'm being honest with myself, there's a lot of times in my life where I would say, you know, probably not, probably not. I, I, I live no differently than anybody else. I'm, I'm impatient, right? I'm unkind. I get, I get bothered by people. I get angry and those things. Well, the Bible says that th- those things are not what love is right? Love is patient and kind. Love is, and so we're, we're, ta- we're going through those things. We're talking about those things uh, today. And so, let's, if you have your notes, I, I, have, I actually have the same notes from last week. Um, I want to talk about uh, three, um, three application questions uh, for us, for you to ask yourself, to think about Right, because in, unless we, unless we're intentional, and this is, goes to be about so many things, unless we're intentional, like like Lonell, Lonell, you've been intentional about learning golf, right? You've been intentional about it. Been saying, I want to go play more. How many? Linda, Al, go play more. Right, it's a good thing. Uh, go play more, or, or 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 take lessons, or learn, watch YouTube videos. Be intentional about it. Um, and so that's what these applica- application questions are about. So the first one is this. The first question we can ask ourselves is this. How is love revealed in my focus? In my focus. It says this, love is not easily angered. It is not self-seeking or, or easily, um, I have angered twice. Maybe, maybe that's the reason why I put it in there twice. But you get the idea, right? It's uh, uh, revealed in my focus. Listen to this definition I heard of anger. You ready for this? Just listen. And you can write it down if you want. Definition of anger. Definition of anger is emotional punishment. You give yourself for someone else's behavior. Wow, when you think of it that way, it's like, wow, right? So next time you get angry, just think about that. Write that definition down, or at least try to remember it. Definition of anger is emotional punishment you give yourself for someone else's behavior. How many of you have ever gotten angry driving a car because there's some idiot in front of you? Anybody? Me and Rick. We know because we talk about it all the time, don't we, Rick? All the time, buddy. All the time. I don't know why. That's, that's when it comes out in my life. It comes out when I'm driving. Pete, anybody? You too, Pete, maybe? Yeah. Um, and so uh, we th- think about like our, our, uh, our, our, what I'm focused on. Here, here's the thing. Those things, uh, you know, uh, getting, uh, getting angry and getting uh, uh, envying and judging. Where's your focus? Right. Focus is here. Right? It's navel gazing. And so your love will be revealed to you in your focus. Now, here's the thing, friends. All of us are, to some degree or another, narcissistic. You know, and, and maybe that's, maybe to a, to a certain degree, it's even healthy. I'd have to clear it with Jamie first. But it's healthy in the sense that you have to care for yourself. Right? You can't just be, you know, uh, willy-nilly about your own life and care about everybody else and just let your life go to, to pot. You, no, that, that's not true. You, you, there's, there's a degree that you have to concern yourself with your life, right? And I, so I'm talking beyond that. I'm talking about uh, how, how when anything happens in the world around you, your experience, the only thing you can think of is how it affects you, Right? Uh, and so driving, you're not worried about, uh, so if somebody cuts you off, right, you judge them by their actions, don't you? Isn't that true? Judge them by their actions. If you cut somebody else off, 
Do you judge yourself by your actions? Chances are you don't. Chances are you judge yourself by your intentions. Your intention wasn't to pull out in front of them. Maybe, maybe, you're, maybe you, were, you were in a spot where you couldn't see them. Maybe that was it. And you didn't mean to pull out and you, know, you pulled out so far and by the time you saw them, it was kind of too late. You had to, commit, you had to go, right? And so you judge yourself by your intent. I, I didn't mean to do that. But they're in the car there and they're judging you strictly by your actions. And so if we could learn to uh, cut other people some slack, and let me ask you a question. If you're driving down the road, and you knew that a car coming up was going to pull out or whatever, and they were rushing to the hospital because their, a loved one was just taken there by ambulance, would it bother you if they cut in front of you? It wouldn't bother you. It wouldn't bother me. So here's the thing. You could tell yourself any narrative that you choose. You could call them an idiot and say, you know, where did you get your driver's license out of a Cracker Jack box, you know, that, that sort of thing, right? You could do that. Obviously, you could do that. And then you could be bothered by it, and you could be angry, and you could sit there and spin some sort of way in which you're going to get back at them, right? Anybody ever do that? Okay. Me, I know me and Rick have to have talked about it, right? I've done it, you know what I mean? If I go here, I could do this, I can get out of the car, I could pull out in front of them, and I'll, that'll teach them. Nah, that's, you know, or I could tell myself a different neck. I'm making it up no matter what. Because that may or may not be true. It's irrelevant. So I could, I could paint a different narrative. I could tell myself something else, right? Um, so listen, you, I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, is a conundrum the right word for this? That you, to say you love God and to behave like a jerk. Aren't those two things just totally uh, uh, oxymoron? That's what it is, right? Oxymoron. Like they're the opposites. You, how, how can we say, and we do, and I do, right? How can we say we love God yet behave like a jerk? Behave in ways that, that are, it's not loving, that doesn't communicate love. How can we do that? Well, obviously we do because we're not perfect, but uh, that song talked about being, you know, being more like Jesus. I remember, how many remember, old enough to remember, uh, a guy by the name of Mylon Lefevre? Remember, anybody know that name, Mylon Lefevre? Really, wow. Anyways, he sang this song. It says, I, I, I want to be more, I need to be more like Jesus, right? And that's true. I, I don't feel which is first. I need to be more, I want to be more. And sometimes I think, like Teresa of Avila, you know, I, I I, I don't want to be like Jesus, because that's hard. I don't even want to be like Jesus, but I want to want to be like him, right? I want to want, and that's, a, that's an honest statement for me, I think. You know, I want to want it first, to be like him. And the reason why I say that, friends, is um, like it's not easy. It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to require, love will require sacrifice. Love will require for you to have maybe some hurt feelings. Love, love will require, uh, love will require you, listen to this, this is, this is, you might write this down. Love will require you to take up your cross. Love will require you to bear a cross. How many does that appeal to, anybody? Doesn't appeal to me. Bear my cross, I don't wanna bear a cross, but, but love requires that. How do I know? Because that's what Jesus did. Jesus bared his cross because of love. Because of love for who? For you, for me, for the world. You know, I was talking to a guy one time and, and uh, we're talking about that, about God's love. And he said, well, well, God loves his children. I said, exactly. He said, yeah, but his children are his followers. I said, really, that, that's what you think? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I said, so not, not everybody. He said, no, God, his Bible says he loves his children. I said, uh, what about God so loved the world? Was he talking about the land mass then? Or was he talking about the world of people? God so loved the world. God so loved humanity. Wow. Yeah, God the Bible says God loves his children. 
Listen, um, the Bible's pretty clear on this. It does not want us to love, uh, in that sense, God loves the world. He loves humanity. But the Bible tells us for us not to love the world. But what he's talking about is the ways of the world. Isn't that true? And the ways of the world are selfishness, are greed, are uh, nothing but navel gazing. That's the way of the world. And um, it says, if anybody loves the world, the ways of the world, did you follow me? So you're, I'm talking about same language but having different meanings. God so loved the world. It's not talking about the ways of the world, right? talking about the people in the world, humanity. But then when it tells us, uh, do not love the world, it's not talking about don't love the people in the world. Don't love the ways of the world. And what's, let me, let me, let me, let me (laughs) spell this out to you, because I think this is so important. I know I've spent a lot of time on this. But the ways of the world are this, are the ways of, uh, the Bible uses another term, the ways of the flesh, right? So the Bible says this, it says, uh, live by the Spirit, and you won't gratify the desires of the sinful nature. The sinful nature is our our flesh, is this. Uh, I think Luke's upstairs probably. I was talking to Luke one day. Uh, He was over for our house for dinner, and and he was talking about how he wants to eat healthy, and and he'd go on this kind of cleansed diet and everything. I said, look, that's so great. And I started talking to him about the benefits of fasting, how good fasting is, your body, your body goes into what's called autophagy, where your good cells eat your bad cells, and it's so healthy. Out in California, they have these places you can go where they're curing cancer by long-term fasting, 21 days of fasting uh, under doctor supervision, because what's happening is your body's in autophagy for that time, and your good cells are eating bad cells, actually eating the cancer cells. And they're curing things like cancer. Anyways, the Bible, all through the Bible, what we read is the Bible talks all the time about fasting. About they, they fasted and they feasted, fasted and feasted. And now we're learning, and we thought, well, fasting's just this spiritual thing. And now we're learning how good fasting is for your physical body, right? Letting your gut rest. How often do we let our gut rest? Like we eat breakfast, and then we eat a, right? We eat breakfast, Pete, and then we eat a nine o'clock sandwich. I worked with Pete, I know. And then we have lunch. Then we have some sort of snack. Then we go home and eat dinner, right? Constantly, that's all we do. And our gut never rests. Our microbiome never rests. And now we know the importance of that, of resting that, right? And so it says this. It says, listen, don't be led by that. So I was telling Luke, and I said to do that. And Luke goes, yeah, but Uncle Jeff, I love food so much. Right? I said, Luke, when you said I, who's I? He said, what do you mean? I said, who's I? He goes, me. I go, yeah, who, who are you? Who's the I? I said, does your spirit love food? I no, I don't think so. Does your body love food? Oh, yeah, my body loves food. Right? And, and that's this idea of don't be, don't, don't just be led around that way. Just only gratifying desires of the sinful nature, the flesh. Don't live that way. Right? Uh, there are many people, Mich- Michelle's one, I talked to her about fasting before. She goes, I, I have such a hard time fasting because I, I get a headache. What's that tell you? It tells your body is addicted to a certain way of being. And we need to take dominion over our body. And that's not just Michelle. That's, I was talking about another friend of mine. He said, I get brain fog. I said, of course you do. Because you're addicted to it. You, you, you're addicted to the, the three meals and three snacks a day. You're addicted to it. Or, or, the, or the coffee in the morning. Whatever it is. You're addicted to it. And the Bible, and, and God doesn't want that for us. He wants us to be led by the Spirit. And, and I say all that to say this. I know I went into the whole you know, rabbit trail there. But the point is this, is living by the Spirit, when you live by the Spirit, guess, guess what? You're going to live a life of love. Live a life of love. So how is, uh, how is your uh, love revealed in your focus? Um, because um, if love, if I'm just focused on me, then I'm just going to live a life like that. And so I turn my, my gaze outward. 
And uh, here's the truth too. Whatever, whatever captures your attention captures you, right? And so the Bible says things like, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So just listen to people speak. Just listen to them talk. And just know that that's what's in their heart. And then know that about you. Pay attention to how you talk and know that. So listen to this. This is the Harvard Business Review uh, talking about, uh, uh, they, did a, they did some research for Disney, okay? And Disney wanted to know around their park what captured the little kid's attention the most, right? And for them, they have their own reasons for that, right? Why they want to know that. And so they began to study young kids, but even, even just toddlers and, 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 and babies in strollers. What captured their uh, kids' attention the most? Can anybody even venture a guess to what it was? I'll tell you this. It wasn't nothing in the, in the park that Disney put there. Guess what it was? It was their parents' cell phone. It was their parents' cell phone. That captured their attention more than anything else. And at first it surprised me, but then I thought, why should that surprise me? Michelle and I were somewhere the other day, and the family had kids. Every one of them were running around, not playing, looking at a screen looking at a screen, or off in a corner looking at a screen, right? And so it's that, it's, that's what captured their attention, right? Um, it, here's why. Even at a young age, they could tell what captured their parents' attention. And they knew this. Think about this for a minute. They knew that that phone was a rival to the attention they desired, because they want their parents' attention. And that phone was a rival. Okay, let's go on, because we need to go into communion. The next thing is this. Um, how is love revealed in my faith? In my faith. If I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. You can be a model Christian in the sense that your behavior, you could go, uh, you can go to church every day, you can read your Bible, you can uh, give to the poor, you can do all those things. But the Bible says this, unless you're doing those things out of love, it's just a banging gong or a clanging cymbal. Um, I forget who it was. I just watched something, maybe even this morning. No, it was last night. And uh, so I forget who was saying this. Uh, They're saying, you ever see this where they, go, uh, where they go and they find a homeless guy and they give him a meal or give him money? You ever see that? And they're videoing it. He said, listen, if you're going to go and you're going to feed the homeless or give them money, don't video it. Why are you doing it? Why are you videoing it? Huh? For who? For you. For you. Right? Like, don't, don't, don't live. That's not out of love. That's out of navel gazing. That's out of yourself. So, so what good is that? The Bible says, friends, it's, it's really not no good. It's, it's, really, it's really not benefit. It's, for you, I mean. Now, the meal for somebody, sure, that's fine but do everything out of love. So how is love revealed in my faith? Uh, Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Um, take, no matter, what, no matter what good you do, it doesn't matter what it is, just think of something good that you, that you do, you like to do. Take love out of that equation, and the Bible's saying, it really has no meaning to take love out of the equation. So I said this earlier, and, I, and, and this is so true. Remember I told you about that, that, uh, that, that church out in Kansas? You know, they, they go out and they're so angry about everything. You, how you see God is so important. Because if you see, if you're God, if his character and his nature, if it's an angry God, guess how you will behave? So, so their, their God is an angry God, an angry God. And so guess how, guess how they behave? Angry. How, it, how actually is God? The Bible says God is what? Anger? No. Is God selfishness? 
No. What is God? God is love. And so, friends, here's the thing. I, I, I know it may seem like, oh, Jeff, you make it sound so simple. It is not simple. It absolutely is not simple. But if you see your God first and foremost as a loving God, a loving God, who went to a cross out of love, who suffered and died out of love. If you see a God that way, guess what you'll do? If you really believe it, I mean, you see in that way and you really believe it, you're going to live that way. You, you, you might suffer, right? You'll bear your cross, but you'll live a life of love. The last thing is this. What does love require me to forgive? Uh, huh. If I really choose love, I'm going I'm to keep others in a very, very high regard if I choose love. 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says this. <laughs> Boy, this is, a, this, is, this is a hard one. It says this, love keeps no records of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Let me tell you a quick story. Steve, come on down here. Uh, Steve's going to lead us in communion. Why well, I just kind of tell this story about Forgiveness. It's the story of Paul. Paul, uh, you, may, you can argue, is the second most important person in the Bible, right? Jesus, number one. Paul, number two. Maybe. I don't know, right? Paul wrote more books of the Bible than anybody else. Paul was this unbelievable leader in the church and everything. And Paul went on a missionary journey with Barnabas. Barnabas took his cousin, Mark. Mark's out there. Mark's young. Mark's out there with them, and Mark gets homesick or whatever. Mark says, adios, I'm catching a boat back to Jerusalem. Well, that just, that got Paul upset. And so later on, you see in Acts, uh, Barnabas says, hey, let, 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 let's get Mark to come with us. You know what I mean? Paul going, no, 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 no. Absolutely not. What was Paul doing? Keeping a what? Keeping a record of wrong. Now, that's not, listen, that's not to say... If you're in an abusive situation and you're being abused by someone or a spouse or whatever, physically, mentally, whatever, right? That doesn't mean you go, oh, I, I, I forgive and I'm not going to keep no record of wrong. I'm going to go back into that. You have to use common sense, people, right? No, a toxic relationship you stay away from. But someone like Mark just being young and immature and making a mistake, right? And later on we find out that Paul, Paul, Paul started living his own words, keep no record of wrong, and, and kind of made amends with Mark, and, and then actually said to other churches, right? We see in Timothy and other places in Galatians where he says, hey, Timothy's coming, man. Timothy's, Timothy's my man. Basically saying that he's my man. Timothy's my man. And he said, I'm not going to keep record of wrong. Friend, this, this is love. So here's the thing. I've asked Steve to come and lead us in communion, and Carl and uh, Peter are going to uh, help in that. Um, during this time, uh, keep this in mind. And Steve and I talked beforehand, and neither of us really know, make sense out of it, but it says this, don't take communion in an unworthy manner. Anybody ever read that? It says some have actually fallen asleep because of it. That's a euphemism for what? Dying. I don't know. That's why I don't, I don't know how to make sense of that. I've never seen anybody die after taking communion. I have never have. Um, I'm sure people have taken communion in an unworthy manner. And what I mean by that is this. Uh, think about this last thing. What do I need to forgive? Use this opportunity when Steve leads us to go, oh, you know what? It's been hard for me, but I'm gonna, gonna make an effort. I'm gonna forgive. Clear your conscience of that, just get rid of it, and enjoy our time of communion. Steve? Oh yeah, gra gra grab a microphone, uh, grab him a microphone, somebody. Connie, did you grab him one? What, what number's that, what number's on there? One. Okay, good morning. Help me. 
Um, so Jeff talked a good bit about fasting, and now we're going to um, take an opportunity as a church family to do some feasting, uh, which I think is pretty cool. Um, I, I'm not going to be super long here because, you know, as Jeff mentioned before, this is my first time in doing this. Um, in my spiritual journey, I am doing a lot of deep research and my own study and prayer time in communion, what that means. And so some of you have, have heard my testimony before. Um, you know, I was born and raised in the Catholic Church, um, which I would never, ever, ever give up that experience. Um, it taught me a lot. And, but as a lot of people know, the Catholics do things in a certain way and they always think it's the right way. So um, whether that's true or not, we're not going to get into that. But the way I was born and raised, you know, was we received communion in one specific way, in one specific place, right, uh, and a certain way to do it. Um, and, and so years and years ago when I met Jeff, one thing that, that, that he's done here at the Freedom Life Center, for I know for a lot of us, is he's helped us to unlearn and rethink a lot of things that we brought when we came here in our own minds and the way we thought about God and the way we thought about worshiping Christ and, and, and that's what I think we're working through through all of his teachings right and, and so communion is no different and so so why so why do we do it so Jeff spent a lot of time in this series and in, in talking about what Paul is talking to in the church in Corinth and, and so after he takes a minute to chastise them for how they're acting during the meal uh, he gives us the reason for why we do this and why we're going to do it today. And Paul simply tells the church, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me, which is what we're going to do today, which is what we're doing here. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and saying, this is the cup. This is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. Again, why are we doing it? In remembrance of him. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim my death. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. So what we're going to do today is... The one thing I know that Jeff really wants all of us to know, and, and it really has to be a constant theme, everybody is welcome inside these doors. I have so many, friends and, and family that we, they ask us about our experience here and it's just so difficult. And I'm sure you all experience this to put into words out there that this is one of the most loving places I think that that we've created for ourselves to come and to worship and, and to, to remember Jesus right and so you know number one we practice open communion it's for everybody to come and join us at this table and remember what Jesus has done for us everybody is welcome and that has to be the message right no matter what we believe or where we've come from that's the message. So that being said, I'm going to have Pete um, and Carl come up, if you don't mind. And I'm also going to use you, Josh. So Carl and Pete are, are going to have some of Jeff's amazing bread. Um, and we're going to have little cups of, I don't think it's real wine. I fought for that, but he didn't. He said no. Uh, and Josh is going to come behind. You can do that behind with him. Oh, yes. So Carl had a really good idea, and I think we're going to we'll go with that um, we'll pray as soon as everybody has you know what they need let's I'm gonna help first
everybody good okay let's pray very quick so Heavenly Father we ask um, that you bless bless this bread and you breath bless this wine that we are about to receive as a church family we do this together in remembrance of the fact that the night you were betrayed that you did take bread and that you broke it and that you gave it to your brothers and you told them that as long as they live that they do this in remembrance of you and similarly afterwards you took the cup so, so let's do that let's break our bread and let's take the bread in remembrance of him Similarly, when the supper was ended, he took the cup. Again, he gave you thanks. He blessed it and gave it to his disciples and said, drink this. As often as you drink this, do this in remembrance of me. So let's take the cup now in remembrance of Jesus. thank you for everything that you've done for us. We thank you for choosing to walk that hill and to give your life for us, for all of us. And we thank you, Lord, for the power in you that raised him from the dead and that he is undeniably alive in our lives today. We remember you for all of this and we thank you in your name. Amen.